Coming to you from deep inside the bowels of a great big empty. Get ready for another episode of The Home Defense Show with Skip Coriel. Hello, American families. Welcome back to this week's episode of The Home Defense Show. I'm your host, Skip Coriel. And if you love your family, care about them deeply, and want to learn how to protect them in every facet of your life, then you've come to the right place. We have a great show for you today, and I know that you're going to love it. And with me in the studio today, I have a special guest producer. In fact, she's a beautiful young lady, and she's sitting on my lap right now. She is my daughter, six-year-old Amethyst Coriel. Amethyst, welcome to the Home Defense Show. Thank you. How are you doing today? Good. Do you ever shoot guns with Daddy? Yes. Yes, you can't nod your head. You have to actually say yes. <laughs> good. I know, I did say yes. Okay, you know, and you're a pretty good shot. I remember you shoot pretty good for a little six-year-old girl. Well, I remember that I did go farthest on my arrow. Oh, yes, you shoot archery too, don't you? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> And I think maybe this fall, you're going to go deer hunting with Daddy again. Would you like that? Uh-huh. Yeah, you like sitting in that tent and playing video games, don't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, Amethyst. On the show today, we have a special guest. His name is Bruce Beach. He has written a book called Society After Doomsday. And with all this talk in the news about North Korea and how they're going to nuke, nuke us and destroy America, I thought it would be a good time to talk about how does geopolitics affect the American family? Because I think that it does at some level. Bruce Beach, he's a radiological scientific officer and former professor of economics. He's the designer, founder, and coordinator of the renowned ARC-2 nuclear survival complex and he has team leaders in all 50 of the United States and a number of other countries. Okay, but what do we do between now and then? Hey, we are going to talk about all things Skip Coriel. That is, it's time to delve deeply, to go down into the dark, deep recesses inside Skip's brain. Would you like to do that, Amethyst? Um, if you mind. If you <laughs> Okay. All right. What have I been doing this week? Well, just this past week, I have planted a field of buck oats. Why would I do that? Well, because deer season's coming up. This is August. We have August and September and then October 1st. That's opening day of archery season right here in Michigan. So I planted a field of buck oats right behind my house on the edge of the swamp. And I'm hoping to get Bambi and Bambi's mom and Bambi's dad to just walk up and eat those buck coats so I can shoot them and then we can skin them out, gut them out and uh, get them processed and eat Bambi all winter long. Uh, how do you feel about that, Amethyst? Sad and that's gross. Sa sad and it's gross? Yeah. It is gross to gut out a deer. It's You've seen me do it before. It's all yucky inside, isn't it? All that blood and stuff. Yeah. But where does where do hamburgers come from? Deer. Yeah, that's right. They come from deer and pigs and cows and stuff like that. So, hey, if you want to grill it, you got to kill it first. What I call this the late summer months is the deep breath before the plunge. You remember that's a quote from Gandalf in, uh, I think, the second or third installation of Lord of the Rings. Getting ready to go into battle. Well, for me, August is the deep breath before the plunge because I've got all the wood that I have to get in to heat with wood during the winter time. I've got all the food that's coming in from the garden. So far, we've canned about 70 quarts in the last two weeks and we'll can another 35 quarts or so tomorrow. We're bringing in cabbage, beans, broccoli, cauliflower, and the tomatoes are about ready to can as well. And I have my wife and children are getting ready to go on a big trip. Amethyst, where are you and Mommy going on your big trip? We are going to lots of people that are there in that place. 
That's kind of vague. Actually, you're going to Kansas, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yes, you're going to Kansas to, to vi visit Grandma and Grandpa. Yes, and a whole bunch of other people. That's right, aunts and uncles and cousins and all kinds of stuff like that. Kansas is a wonderful place. But here's the bad part. Daddy can't go with you. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of sad, but I've got like three classes that week, and I can't get out of them. And someone has to pay for this trip to Kansas. So that means that when you and Mommy and Cedar and Phoenix go on the trip, you're going to have to be extra alert on the drive down to Kansas. Can you do that for me? I'll try. I know you will. You just keep your eyes and ears open, and you watch Mommy's back, okay? How do I do that? I'm, I'll be too tired to watch. And have well, <laughs> you will be tired, I know. You're only six years old. How about if we let your brother Cedar, he's 11, he'll have to, he'll have to help watch out, okay? Uh-huh. But if you remember, you can help too. Stay close to Mommy, and... Just let her protect you, okay? Okay. Because I know you guys will have a great time. I will be saddened uh, when you guys go. But, hey, you guys will have a lot of fun, and Daddy will get a lot of good work done. And Okay. Well, Amethyst, thank you very much for being the guest producer on the show today. We will have you on the Home Defense Show another time. Okay. All right. Say goodbye to all the listeners. Bye. Say stay safe. Stay safe. All right. Love you, honey. Love you too, honey. See, I just got a nice kiss from my six-year-old daughter. That is the wonderful thing about working at home is I never leave my children and my wife. It's just great. Uh, the bad part about working at home is you never leave work. It's like I never get a break. If the phone rings, I pretty much have to answer it. But, hey, that's the way that it is. Let's delve deeply now into the news. First off, I saw a rather odd thing come across my email box. It was from the Second Amendment Foundation, a travel advisory for the state of California. The Second Amendment Foundation has issued its first travel advisory ever. Avoid California if you're armed. Their rules and attitude toward gun possession has gotten so bad, the risk to you from government is greater than the risk you face from criminals, or maybe the same thing. For safety, Second Amendment Foundation advises you go elsewhere if you can. Police who say they would never confiscate guns no longer live in the state of California. Wow. That is a big statement. Nothing like that has ever been issued before. I mean, you would expect things like that in, like, communist countries or... But you know what? Maybe California is is a communist country. They they seem to want to be independent. There's a big independence movement in California. Quite frankly, I, I, I'm advocating California as a free state. They should be their own country. Let them have the whole state, and we'll just have to somehow do without their electoral votes. But if they're not going to advocate freedom, I don't think we need them. All right, let's move on to the news, uh, BearingArms.com. Quote, he had a knife, I had pepper spray. And even though I ran for blue lights that are scattered all around campus, he was faster, stronger, and I did not win. College campus rape survivor Shayna Lopez Rivas tells Florida legislatures that pepper spray is not a sufficient defensive tool. Women need guns. Well, no kidding. Rapists don't want you to have guns. They want you to have pepper spray. They want you to take the, the car keys that you have and put them between your, your forefinger and your middle finger and try to ward them off that way. That just frustrates me when I hear women say, oh, I don't need a gun. I've got pepper spray. Or I don't need a gun. I have my keys. I'll just stick my keys in their eyeball. Sure you will. Actually, you won't. They're going to come up behind you. They're going to jerk you down onto the ground and drag you off into the bushes and then they will have their way with you, and you may or may not survive. If you got a gun, you just pull out that gun, you go bam, 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 high upper chest region, and you put them down, and they will never rape another woman ever, ever again. Huh. Anyways, now this lady, she is lobbying the Florida legislature to pass a law that would allow concealed carry on campus for concealed carry holders. I think that's a great idea. 
I think all states should do that. It's a basic human right. Why should women be disarmed on campus? I mean, the, the rape epidemic is going crazy on college campuses. And if men aren't going to respect women and they want to do those kinds of things, they deserve whatever they get. Since we're going to be speaking about society after doomsday with Bruce Beach, let's talk about the reason we're doing that. What is in the news? If I go to Drudge Report right now, what do I see? I'll just read the headlines. Trump, military ready. North Korea warns could reduce USA to ashes at any moment. Back channel to diplomacy is ongoing. Guam to residents. Don't look at flash or fireball. Japanese troops begin joint exercise. China lectures America. Don't go first. Russia, risk of war very high. Chicago, if you are outside when nuke blast occurs and radiation antidote flying off shelves at local supply stores. And then there's a big picture of Donald Trump. And in red, it says locked and loaded. Folks, that's why we're talking about North Korea today. That's why we're talking about the risk of nuclear war. What would actually happen if they tried to nuke Japan or, North, or South Korea or Guam or Hawaii? They can reach all the way to Denver now. That puts all of us at risk. When you think about it, they only have to nuke one city. And that would really affect our way of life, our freedom, our whole economy. This is a serious thing. Are we going to have a third world war, a nuclear war? This reminds me a lot of the Cuban Missile Crisis back in the early 60s. Yes, I was alive back then. I watched it on television as a small little child. But that's what we're talking about today. And we are wondering, will Kim Jong Insane Asylum shoot off that first nuke? We will wait and see. Operators are standing by film at 11. Okay, folks, this is Skip Quirrell on the Home Defense Show. We're going to take a little break here. When we come back, we will have Bruce Beach, author of Society After Doomsday, and we'll be speaking all about North Korea, the threat there, and how we can prepare our families for the threat of all-out nuclear annihilation. Think about that and smile. Actually, while I'm gone, go ahead. I want you to drop down, point your feet towards the blast, and cover your ears because it's going to be loud. This is Skip Coriel on Home Defense Show. We will be right back. My name is C.J. Coriel. Welcome to the Home Defense Show with my dad, Skip Coriel. Don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want to talk to you about keeping your kids safe around guns. I've never been a big fan of trigger locks, but I have to tell you, I have found a product called Child Safe One. It's a trigger blocker, not a trigger lock, and it works fantastic. I tried it out on my kids, and they could not get the Child Safe One off the training gun. I gave them five minutes. I sat there and I watched them, and they couldn't do it. Folks, I am satisfied, more than satisfied, that my kids are safe around Child Safe One. Here's the good thing about it. I can get that lock off the gun in under two seconds, but my kids can't even figure out how it works. Child Safe One is a win-win for everyone in the family. My wife's happy because she knows the guns are secure. My kids are happy because they're safe. And I'm happy because when the wolf comes a-knocking, I've got that gun cocked, locked, and ready to rock in less than two seconds. So go to GlobalGunSafety.com and get Child Safe One today. That's GlobalGunSafety.com. Check it out now and tell them the Home Defense Show sent you. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel, and I have a special guest with me this morning. His name is Bruce Beach, uh, a radiological scientific officer and former professor of economics. 
He is the designer, founder, and coordinator of the renowned ARC-2 Nuclear Survival Complex. Bruce Beach, welcome to the Home Defense Show. Thank you, and it's indeed a pleasure to be here with you, Skip. All right. I've got your book here in my hand, Society After Doomsday. Uh, before we get too far into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your book and a little bit about ARC-2? ARC-2 is a survival complex up in Canada. It's built of 42 buried school buses, and it has the first buses were put in in 1980. They lie at a depth beneath the soil of, at the deepest end, 14 feet of earth above them, and at the shallow end, 5 feet of earth above them. It is a very large, and ten, a matter of fact, 10,000 square foot complex in a very uh, secure area of uh, North America, uh, north of Toronto, about 90-some miles in mm-hmm. Canada. Wow. And now that's the um, uh, survival complex. It has been shown on many videos and movies, one thing or another, on TV, so it's possible to see pictures of it. My book, Society After Doomsday, is available through uh, Amazon. Sometimes they, I manage to get them together away. I just wish more people would uh, see and avail themselves after it. If the intent of the book is to tell people how to recreate communities around them after the great catastrophe and and what they're going to have to do. And also I have uh, put out a thing called the paper uh, that people can download from the internet that gives them, it's, I think, a 32-page paper. It's a large printed master that they can reprint if they want to to give out to people. But it gives them a more succinct view of the all that's in the book. All right. All right. Fantastic. Well, Bruce, there's a lot going in the, on in the news right now. This, well, it seems like there always is these days. But this week, the focus has been on North Korea. And, you know, I've been reading your newsletter for years and years and years, and you seem to have a, your, your, your finger on the pulse of the news. Uh, you're certainly very well informed. What is your opinion on uh, North Korea, what happened, what might not happen? Is that where we should be watching at all? What's your take on it, Bruce? I read the same news as everyone else does the, and listen to opinions. The, the one marker opinion at this moment is that politically, in accordance with the doctrines of the Pentagon and so forth, Trump would not dare act without first evaluating the families uh, the military personnel in in Korea. There's rumors out that he is on edge already with a number of the uh, military community, and for him to preemptively to take that action uh, without uh, their uh, military brotherhood concern would be unusual. The uh, thing is that uh, they did uh, do drills and did a drill uh, just a couple of months ago of evacuating the families. They all packed up their bags. They're only allowed to take so much uh, per person. Then all went to the uh, assigned locations for the airplanes and got in line, and the planes were there. Everything was ready except that they did not have them get onto the planes and fly away. If they had had, people would have shook in their boots. They will again shake in their boots if that does transpire, but that's considered to be one of the final total signs that it is imminent. On the other hand, side, uh, the questions are about the firing at Guam, because that's where the bombers are flown out of to fly over uh, North Korea. The big issue is about the military exercises uh, taking place there in South Korea and each one threaten, side threatens the other. If you do this, I'll do that, and you stand in mortal danger. It is a trigger that is occupying everyone's eyes at the moment and perhaps really diverting their eyes from other things taking place in the world that are really of more significance that are leading to this uh, world uh, 
catastrophe of uh, nuclear World War III. I know you're my senior. How, how old are you right now? In my 80s, and my wife just had her 90th birthday this summer. She remarks and that we have all seen it come, seen everything come in the world today because going to school and on buckboards and and or sleighs in the winter time mm-hmm. here uh, before there were any automobiles up here and and or telephones or electricity and, and all of this television and all these many monitors the internet and all have come into existence she says we've seen it all come and we're going to see it all go <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, uh we've been around to see many things and see them sometimes twice the world wars and the wars in vietnam and korea and, and uh over in uh, iraq and afghanistan and the cuban missile crisis uh, younger people view them as history we view them as experience so it uh, does give one a different view of the world. Yeah, well, it gives you a, a lot more perspective, doesn't it? <clears throat> um, we think so because so many people just think, well, this isn't going to happen or that or this is the way things continue on. or They don't really see the thread of how th- it pulls out and how things will be and what will transpire. Well, Bruce, you, you talked about other portions of the world, and I, and I know from reading your newsletter, you talk a lot about... India and Pakistan, do you believe that that's uh, a more serious threat from over in that region, more so than North Korea? Yes, and particularly uh, those who really watch that area today feel that it's very much on edge. A new player has entered in in the last year, didn't really anticipate that they would be played such a prominent role at this time, and that's China. And China is being very supportive of uh, Pakistan and at this edging uh, the uh, U.S. out of its uh, prominence there in Afghanistan. They're almost twin locations, and their conflicts between those two there is just one location. And at the same time, it's becoming rather bellicose for, for the first time in a long time with India over certain areas. Bhutan and China and, and India interface. So we have here these three nuclear powers. The one who is always the most threatening, we are going in, the, in that part of the world, the same language that uh, Kim Jong uses about North Korea. Uh, with the, we'll do this to you and we'll do that to you. That comes from Pakistan to India. India, of course, is a major nuclear power. It, the least threat from it explained that we, we don't make any distinction between tactical nuclear weapons, strategic nuclear weapons. You use any nuclear weapon, and we were going to step on you with all the force possible. Uh, they give sort of a Trumpian statement of you will experience a day such as no has never been seen in this world, and the, and the ta-ta-ta-ta, and this is what India responds back to Pakistan. Every past president have said the most dangerous spot is what's called the line of control between Pakistan and India because it's over water rights and all that they have. Oh, okay. Gig- gigantic struggle. Okay. So you're, what you're thinking is there will be a regional war eventually, maybe over uh, border disputes between Pakistan yes. and, and India or, or India and China? Well, yes, it's a domino effect. It, it can't be avoided once it begins. If a conflict be- begins between two nuclear powers, no one's going to lose that war. No one's going to win that war because once one is in mortal danger of being destroyed, such as in North Korea, they will launch everything they have. They they say we're about to be destroyed. It's use it or lose it, and we're going to use it. Once any nuclear power does this, the others are going to say, oh, oh look, uh, it's all coming apart, and we're going to do our thing. If it's in Iran or North Korea, wh- whichever one, uh, the other would uh, do their thing in their area. And uh, people in, uh, in those areas will say, uh, Turkey will say, okay, I can see that where this is coming down with Iran. We're going to get on to Russia before things. And Russia will say, oh, this is... Uh, 
uh, I know, we know what those Iranians and Turks will do, and then the Saudis and, and others. So uh, we're going to, uh, years ago, uh, there was a policy declared of no first use mm-hmm. and a mutual assured destruction. It doesn't, right. it doesn't make any difference if you strike us. We will destroy you because we you can't destroy all of our capability, and we will have sufficient surviving capability. If you use it, you're dead. So everybody was uh, uh, supposedly safe because no one would use it. But new philosophies have appeared in the world, such as the Christian philosophy, waiting for Christ to return. The Muslims are expecting the coming back of the body, and, and their philosophy says that he won't return until this affair that Christians call Armageddon occurs. And so they wanted to return. The world state is so terrible for Let's get on with it and get him through it. We, we have to be worthy of that. We have to show ourselves worthy warriors and that we're going to take on these massive powers that are so excessive to us that we have faith. And we will do this as the saying is, bring the temple down. That's from the Bible. And, and he, he was the strongest man on the earth at that time. And, uh, Samson placed his hands on the pillar and, and, and he brought it down. So, Bruce, basic, I think what you're telling me is that the doctrine of mutual assured destruction that we used for, for decades with the U.S. and the Soviet Union isn't really applicable uh, today. No, both countries have clearly declared, push us too far and we'll be the first to use. And that's the, th- the dialogue between Trump and Kim Young today. If you put on your war games, I'm going to pull this down and... And if you do uh, one more test or launch that, it's an ancient tradition in warfare. The Indian tribes would get out there and each would beat their chest and shout at the other about the terrible things that they were going to do to them, you know. Mm -hmm. It's nothing new in the history of man in that regards. Eventually, someone will do it, and once one does it, everybody will do it because they they, they said, "Uh uh-oh, the street rumble has begun. And that guy knifed that other guy, and I know the rest of the gang over there is going to come at people, and I'd better get my guy before he gets me that I'm facing. And so it's on. Wow. You know. All right. Well, Bruce, we're, we're about out of time for this segment. I think we've established the condition of the world right now. So when we come back, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk more about how it affects individuals on maybe a family scale. So... This is Skip Coriel on Home Defense Show. Uh, Don't go anywhere. Listen to our advertisers. We've got some good sponsors. I want you to try and get in some decent shape. So while we're gone, go ahead and do about uh, 50 arm curls, about 20 pounds each. Do 25 push-ups, one-handed if you can. And when we come back, we'll be speaking again with Bruce Beach from ARC2, author of Society After Doomsday. This is Skip Coriel on Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. on the Home Defense Show. Always use guns safely and wisely. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want to talk to you about keeping your kids safe around guns. I've never been a big fan of trigger locks, but I have to tell you, I have found a product called Child Safe One. It's a trigger blocker, not a trigger lock, and it works fantastic. I tried it out on my kids, and they could not get the Child Safe One off the training gun. I gave them five minutes. I sat there and I watched them, and they couldn't do it. Folks, I am satisfied, more than satisfied, that my kids are safe around Child Safe One. Here's the good thing about it. I can get that lock off the gun in under two seconds, but my kids can't even figure out how it works. Child Safe One is a win-win for everyone in the family. My wife's happy because she knows the guns are secure. My kids are happy because they're safe. And I'm happy because when the wolf comes a-knockin', I've got that gun cocked, locked, and ready to rock in less than two seconds. So go to GlobalGunSafety.com and get Child Safe One today. That's GlobalGunSafety.com. Check it out now and tell them the Home Defense Show sent you. 
Wouldn't it be wonderful if life was like the movies and the good guys always won? In today's world, if you're forced to use your firearm to protect yourself, you will need protection. Firearms Legal Protection is here for you. FLP provides you with seasoned, experienced attorneys that handle your criminal and civil matters as a result of you protecting yourself. FirearmsLegal.com provides its members with uncapped attorney's fees, bail bond protection, and coverage in all 50 states. We are not a reimbursement plan. You can access uncapped attorney's fees for as low as $10 a month. Firearms Legal members are provided with educational services, training videos, and access to our vast national attorney network. While you're protecting yourself, let Firearms Legal protect you. Listen up, folks. This is important. There are plenty of legal protection services out there, but none will protect you as well as Firearms Legal Protection. This is the one I use and the only one I recommend. Visit FirearmsLegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and protect your family now. All right, folks, this is Skip Coriola on Home Defense Show. We are back with Bruce Beach from ARC2. Bruce, I want to take this from the geopolitical level right down to the family level. Everyone always talks about preparation for doomsday and you can watch these shows like doomsday preppers and and all of those things. I'm just wondering, is there really anything that individual families can do to prepare for either a limited nuclear strike or an all-out nuclear strike? Can you just talk about that for a couple of minutes? I tell people the first and foremost important thing to do is if you live in the city, get out of the city. And the second most important thing to do is to get out of the city. And the third most important thing to do is to get out of the city. From that point down, we will start looking at other minor things that one might do. First, let me say about preparing shelters. I tell people the worst type of shelter that you can get into is a public shelter. Going down in under a mall in some town somewhere or into uh, the basements of anything of that nature or into a subway. Number one, in North America, the shelters aren't prepared. In other countries, they are. And they have great civil defense plans, but not in North America. There is no preparation. And going into such a location with totally unprepared people where there will be some who are organized, such as motorcycle gangs or such, we always say, whoever they are that come in uh, to these places, you're just in a worse situation that you can possibly get into. And there will be no exterior forces to help you. That's something like Katrina, people piled up into the big stadium. But there was a whole United States out there to send the military and the sin and relief and one thing, none of that will exist in this situation. The number two worst place of a shelter is a private personal home shelter. People say, oh, I'm going to stock up my beans, bullets, and Bible here and put my faith in God and we'll stand the enemy. I'll, I'll protect my family. Can't happen. And the reason why is one male cannot stand at watch 24 hours a day They're only defending one shelter, but these people that will come around and take them out have had practice on several before they've gotten to you. It's just not a doable. There is a plan, and yes, you you can definitely have a plan for survival, and that is to be prepared to help other people. You cannot stock enough food, medicine, or anything else to be able to help other people, but there are skills you can stock. Things like knowing how to detect radiation, ability to have communication to, uh, with ham radio or whatever, to know what's going on. Information is always very important to people. There are many skills that one can develop that, that people will be in such dire need of, the main one being able to produce or get food. But the number one skill that people are going to need is the ability to work with other people, to get people organized, and how to organize people to work afterwards. And that we call a system of learns, local economy recovery networks, and understanding what you need to do to be a leader and to lead others out of the situation when it occurs. That's the number one skill. Bruce, I think you and I agree on that. What I've done in my 
neighborhood here is I've organized uh, a neighborhood community watch because we know who we are, what our skill sets are, and I've moved closer to family, obviously out of the city. I am trying to learn skill sets that will be valuable afterwards. I'm trying to get like the the foundation for what you're talking about in place so that when something does happen, I can just go around and talk to my neighbors and say, hey, look look what's going on here. Uh, maybe we should get organized. Because what I've found is if you try and do that, you know, while the sun is shining, if you start talking about 40 days of rain and and try, try building an ark, people look at you like you're total Looney Tunes and, and they don't listen to you. Uh, what do you think about that? Oh, you're absolutely uh, correct about that. Trying to get anybody to form any sort of social organization beforehand is impossible. In fact, they look askance at if anybody does. Uh, people do help me, but they try to do it very surreptitiously uh, <laughs> around here uh, That because nobody wants to be associated with sure. crazy old fool. You see. <laughs> well, Bruce, you know, we're almost running out of time, but before we go, uh, I have some questions, some personal questions here. Um, that I think families might be interested in. What is the difference between a, a dosimeter and a Geiger counter when we're talking about detecting radiation? And it's not just dosimeters and Geiger counters. It's dosimeters and radiation meters. Geiger counters actually count the impulses coming from disintegration of natural uranium or something like that. Uh, and that's what we use to look for them by that uh, method. But the measure of uh, the radiation uh, that one gets from a nuclear weapon, we call a radiation meter and uh, rad meter. And that just tells you how much radiation that source is putting out. You look at it and, and it will say something like, in an hour's time, this will put out 10 rad. A dosimeter does the opposite. A dosimeter tells you how much radiation you have received. The only way that it can tell you is if it's been with you when you received it. It's not like a thermometer or something that you can oh, go yeah. to a person and say to him, oh, you let me stick this in your ear or whatever, or put it under your tongue and find out how much radiation you've received. It has to have been with you. But if it was with you, and it will say it has received this much radiation, and then you can say, oh, I've gotten that much radiation. There are many types of those centers, but you have to have one that you can, what we call zero, set it back to zero, and then just set it down in the place where you're wanting to measure the radiation, and you leave it there for an hour, and an hour later you look at it and you say, oh, there's so this much radiation per hour here. That's the same thing that a rate meter will tell you. But the rate meter tells you instantly, this takes the dosimeter an hour to tell you. That is for that reason that I highly recommend and say the most valuable device that anyone, if you're going to get any equipment in that uh, category, get a dosimeter, a rechargeable dosimeter. Yeah, actually, that, that does sound like good advice. Now, another thing is Faraday cages. What are they and do they really work? Faraday cages uh, were, they just stop radiation. We have what is called the electromagnetic spectrum, and it's uh, the visible part of it. It's very low, uh, very narrow part of that spectrum. But on the edges of this, there's other frequencies of radiation. And one of the frequencies are what we call an electromagnetic pulse uh, put out by nuclear weapons. With any of these uh, frequencies, they can be picked up by an antenna. Radio frequency signal or electrical signal comes along of these long wires or antennas or anywhere like that. What a Faraday cage is is simply a wire box. It could be just a metal box. That, but usually we make a cage. It's just like chicken wire all around the thing. And it's like an antenna. So it absorbs all these signals coming from whatever direction they're coming. But the thing that we're wanting to protect, we put inside that box and insulate it from the walls of the box. 
with whatever insulators we put in. You can put in foam or one thing or another just to keep it away from the edges of the box. So the electrical signal goes all around the box, but it can't go inside the box uh, to the center part, which you have insulated from the box and which you, where you have put that electronic device that okay. you're wanting to protect. There's one other essential about a Faraday cage, and that is it must be grounded. You then have to run a wire from the box down into the ground. You can tie it to your water pipes oh, in okay. your house mm -hmm. if you want to. And your box can be a metal a garbage can. And you run a wire from your metal garbage can to the water pipes and then but whatever you uh, you put some foam top bottom and and uh, all around your thing that you're insulating inside and there's your Faraday cage. Well, you know, Bruce has another question. You, you'll see these on, uh, you know, the movies that they have about nuclear Armageddon. People will be taking in radiation through fallout. And in the movies, they'll just go ahead, they'll drink a bottle of iodine, and that somehow magically protects them. It, can you talk about that? Well, they wouldn't have to worry about dying from radiation then if they buy it and drink a bottle of iodine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, yes, uh, what the, the theory about that is, is there are various radioisotopes, and one of the most prominent ones is the iodine-138. And uh, that isotope gets into food, water, uh, people take it into the body, and the body loves iodine, and everybody needs some iodine in their body, or they're going to have problems. And the particular gland in the body that uh, sorts out the iodine is the pituitary gland. This particular gland will then sort out this radioisotope of iodine that comes in, and, and it's very deadly. If instead, when one knows they're, they're going to be in a situation where this radioactive iodine is about, they will take potassium iodide, you know, we call it KI, and you don't have to take very much, and you don't have to actually take it near as long as we thought before, and we've done a number of forms, and you can even take a compound of it and paint it on the uh, soles of baby's feet, and mm -hmm. it'll be sorted through the skin, or painted on their stomachs, just like they do for an operation or whatever, and, and once the pituitary gland becomes full of this iodine, it won't take in anymore. Now comes along the radioactive iodine, and the body has no way to absorb it. It just passes it out of the body. Okay. And uh, so you're therefore protected from the radioactive iodine, which would otherwise cause cancer. But it only protects you from that one factor, but that's an important one before. From. That's great. You've given us uh, three good things here. You've talked about dosimeters and Faraday cages and potassium iodide. So uh, we appreciate all of that knowledge. Uh, Bruce, before we let you go, will you please just tell us how people can uh, get your book, where people can go to learn more about all the things that you do? My main website is webpal.org. They can get on there. They can track me down, find me. I've got that information and a lot of their information. I'll just give it away free to people if they'll just reach out to me. Bruce, that's fantastic. I'll make sure that I put that on my website along uh, with this podcast link so people can get a hold of you if they need to. Bruce, I want to thank you very much for being on the show today and for all that you do. I, I know this is uh, voluntary work that you do trying to educate all the people of the world. So, Bruce, God bless you, and thank you very much for being on the show. Well, thank you, Skip. I'm enjoying always talking with you. Okay, this is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. We're going to be away for a couple of minutes. You're already tired from doing all those arm curls. So go ahead and rehydrate and just rest up. Go to webpal.org and check out all things Bruce Beach. This is Skip Coriel on Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Welcome to my dad's home defense radio show. You're going to love it. Hey, folks. This is Skip Coriel, host of the Home Defense Show. 
I want to tell you about my book, Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book. More and more people across the country are seeing the dangers in society and deciding to carry concealed to protect themselves and their families. My new book lays it out step by step. It'll teach you how to protect and defend the ones you love. Get the benefit of 17 years of teaching experience and a lifetime of training for this important role in society and in your family. You can get civilian combat real easy. Just go to Amazon.com, search on Skip Coriel Civilian Combat, it'll pop right up there. Don't put it off any longer. Get Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book, by yours truly, Skip Coriel. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. All right, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. We have had a really good show today. We're not over yet, so don't go anywhere. But I tell you, Bruce Beach is a very interesting fellow, 80-some years old, living in the wilds of Canada, originally from the United States. I believe he was in the U.S. Navy, stationed in Alaska, if I'm remembering correctly. A former American. He would probably still view himself as an American. I don't know. But... It just got me to thinking all the things that we were talking about and all the things that we're living through right now. I grew up in the 60s, a child of the 60s, you know, flower power, hippies, drugs, rock and roll, all that stuff. But along with that in the 60s, you had the Vietnam War. But then first and foremost, if you grew up in the 60s, the 70s, even the 50s, You were living in the shadow of nuclear annihilation. Living in the shadow. Children of the A-bomb. I remember when I was growing up, I lived about halfway between Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids, uh, the two largest cities in West Michigan. I still live there today. And I remember at night, I would go out after dark and I'd be sitting in the yard just watching the stars, and I would look to the north, and I would see a light in the clouds. The clouds were all lit up because there was a major city there, Grand Rapids. But it was enough light to light up the the sky over it on a cloudy night. And then I'd turn 180 degrees, and I'd look to the south, and I would see the clouds lit up there, and it would that was Kalamazoo. And so I was sandwiched between... Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids, right about halfway in between. And I remember, you know, as a 14-year-old kid, a 12-year-old kid, I was thinking, am I far enough away from these cities? If the Soviet Union strikes, if they lob a 20-megaton missile onto Grand Rapids, am I going to be okay? And that's not something that a a 12- or a 14-year-old child should really have to worry about. But it was foremost on my mind. I remember that, wondering about prevailing winds, fallout, things of that nature. One of the books that I read was written by Pat Frank called Alas Babylon. And it was a paperback novel all about all-out nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union and about the survivors in Florida. And I always wondered, gosh... If it happens, will I be a survivor or will I be one of those people who die slowly of radiation sickness or will the skin melt off my body? And uh, that's morbid. But I find myself thinking about it again, even though for the most part the, the the Soviet Union is gone. But now we have to deal with Russia and China who are rattling their sabers. And have you heard that saying, I don't fear the country with a thousand nukes. I fear the country 
with one nuke. And I think I agree with that. Remember that doctrine of mutual assured destruction that we were talking about with Bruce Beach in, in the last segment? The doctrine of MAD, mutual assured destruction, it only works if the superpowers are sane, if they care about living and dying, if they don't want to commit suicide or genocide. But it doesn't work with insanity. If someone doesn't care if they live or die, they can't be deterred. We see this in the suicide bombers, Islamic terrorists. They can kill a lot of people simply because they're willing to die while they're doing it. And someone like Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-un sane asylum, whatever you want to call him, if he's truly insane or evil, how can you deter a man like that? He has nuclear weapons. Now he's miniaturized them. He's putting them on nuclear missiles, ICBMs, as we speak. And he's threatened us many, many, many times. When an insane person threatens to kill you, I really think you should take him seriously. I don't think you should second guess him or, oh, well, maybe he won't. Let's not take it too seriously. I think you should take it seriously. I really think that you should. Some of the things that we, that we talked about with Bruce, what can the average person do about it? Geopolitics, what can we do? What can our families do? Well, I think there's a lot that you can do. I think what you should be doing is hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. And when I say hoping, I also mean praying. I'm a praying man. And I think we should be praying for our leaders. I think that we should be praying for peace, but that we should also be preparing for war. Because we very well might be headed that direction. What would happen if Kim Jong-un lobbed an ICBM and hit Los Angeles, or Denver, or Portland, or Seattle, or Honolulu. First, you have to deal with the, uh, the radiation cloud that's going to cover a portion of America. Here in Michigan, unless they hit Chicago, we're not going to have to worry about that. But a lot of the country will have to worry about it. Now, don't go out and drink a bottle of iodine, okay? I mean, we went over that with Bruce. All that's going to do is make you really, really sick, maybe even kill you. Potassium iodide is what you want, and are called KI. Uh, you can buy it online. It's all over. I've seen it. You're protecting against iodine-138, which is very poisonous to the human body. So it might not be a bad idea to just go online before the shortages kick in, because I think there will be shortages, and just have enough for your family. Uh, maybe your neighbors, people that you love, and stick them in your uh, bug out bag, in your prepping supplies, and just have it there. Another thing you might want to do is go ahead and order some of these dosimeters. I was looking at them online. There's all different kinds, and you can get them fairly cheaply. You can get disposable ones that you know you might need for the first 48 hours or so, and when they're done, you just throw them away. But it would at least tell you how much radiation your family is taking in. Put one in the basement, put one upstairs, so that you know when it's safe to come out, if it's safe to come out, because we really don't know what's going to happen. God knows, and, and he's not talking about it. So I think a dosimeter is a pretty good idea. Geiger counters, those are kind of expensive, kind of pricey. Now granted, I'd like to have one of those, just to make me feel better, but I don't think I'm going to be able to afford one of those anytime soon. But you know what I could afford is a Faraday cage. I really wanted to talk to Bruce about that because I wanted, first I wanted to know, do they actually work? I mean, I, I was all over the internet scouring that, looking at those. I didn't want to go through the trouble if they weren't going to work, but obviously they are going to work. So I think I'm going to get some, some foam or some styrofoam and uh, build some uh, chicken wire or welded wire fencing around that. And I think I'll, I'll put in a cell phone. That's assuming that cell phones would even work. You know, it depends on what actually happens. 
Will cell phones work? It, well, it depends on how hard we're hit. Do we have electricity at all? But, you know, at the very worst, I mean, you can put in a uh, one of those emergency radios. They got a little hand crank on the side and a little solar panel for power. Because, you know, if you're talking about EMP, I mean, gosh, if I was a crazy man with 50 nuclear missiles, uh, I would not hesitate to put three of them over the United States at about uh, 20 miles up and go ahead and light them off and take the power grid down. Faraday cage is cheap to make. You don't even have to buy anything. I mean, you could, I was thinking I could make one out of a milk carton, one of those plastic milk cartons, and set them on top of some styrofoam or foam rubber or something just for insulation and then build my chicken wire around it. What is it going to hurt for me to do that? I'm not out anything. If something bad happens, I'm covered. So, you know, one of the things that people are concerned about is that they'll look crazy. I mean, all of us with good reputations are concerned what other people will think about us, right? And that's probably healthy for the most part. But is it going to hurt to go online and if you got four people in your family, buy four dosimeters. If you've got, uh, go ahead and buy a, a portable battery-powered radio. One with a hand crank is even better. Uh, build a Faraday cage. It'd probably take you 15 minutes to do that. Get some K1, some potassium iodide. What will you be out if you do that? 15 minutes of your time? And just put it away in a crate down in the basement. And you know what? No one has to even know that you have that. You don't have to walk around wearing a tinfoil hat, you know, with your friends worried about you. You say, oh my gosh, what's wrong with Skip? He's, he's finally gone off the deep end. Don't worry about that. People don't even have to know. But I think the bottom line is, yeah, you got to protect your family. And quite frankly, paranoia is being afraid of something that's not real, that can't happen. But you know what, folks? Kim Jong-un, it's estimated he has 60 nuclear bombs. The threat is real. So it's not paranoid to prepare for a realistic, viable threat. So I say go ahead and do it. What do you do besides that? Well, hey, you do the same things you always do every week after you watch this show. You go online, Amazon.com, and, and you order a copy of Civilian Combat, the concealed carry book by, you got it, Skip Coriel. Read that book. I expect Kim Jong-un lobs a couple of missiles. People are going to have a renewed interest in personal and family defense. Also, check out our sponsors, Firearms Legal Protection, Firearms Legal dot com slash Midwest Tactical. Check that out. Get protected legally. Elite Firearms and Training. Go to EliteFirearms.us. Get in touch with Larry Jackson and he'll fit you with a really nice handgun. And then once you got that handgun, go to GlobalGunSafety.com and order Child Safe One. That will keep your children safe from your guns. And you'll have that loaded gun in your hand, cock locked, ready to rock in less than two seconds. Protect your family. Okay, folks, that about wraps it up for this week's episode of the Home Defense Show. Next week, I think we're going to be talking about, well, whatever's in the news. It's hard to plan a show because I don't know what's going to happen over the week. I could be breathing radioactive dust by next week, or I could win the lottery. We'll see what happens. Until next week, remember your purpose in life is to find something greater than yourself and serve it. Always remember God, family, country in that order. It's important how you live, but it's equally important how you die. Your family and the ones you love need your protection, so train, always train. Stay alert, stay alive. Until next week on the Home Defense Show, this is your host, Skip Coriel. God bless you, God bless your family, and God bless America. Thank you for joining us this week on The Home Defense Show. Now, get out there and protect the ones you love. We'll see you next week with more of the best in home defense. Bye-bye, boys! Have fun!
fun storm in the castle.